what miracle were they looking for? They saw dangerous dimensions of God. But at the slightest opportunity, they bowed to bow. They committed adultery with Ashtaroth. Just as it was in Matthew chapter 25, the bridegroom arrived. Here also, in 3 and especially in 5, you find out that the, the, her lover, her king, returns to the house. And yet she's unwilling to get up from the bed. So what I hope to do tonight is now stay in Matthew 25. I know this scripture has been dealt with over and over throughout this conference. I just want to add one block. And then we begin to pray. And then the Holy Ghost will touch down. He says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Why are they classified as virgins? Though the Bible in context is speaking about a woman who has never had sex. But the meaning of virginity here goes beyond just the natural expression of virginity. Because if you read the Bible, you will find out that the female is used as a metaphor for the church. Used as metaphor for nations. So, in describing nations and describing peoples, there are various shapes a nation can take. The shape of the people, the church, and the nation that God seeks is that they must be virgins. And this virginity is not just about chastity and purity. It's about consecration. Are you with me? If you are with me, say amen. amen. This virginity is not just about chastity. It's not just about purity. It's not just about virtue. It's about consecration. That is, they are not just virgins because they are pure. They are virgins because they are separated unto God. That's what that context means. Because all you need to do is do careful Bible study, especially in the Old Testament, and you will find that the reason God consistently gave laws in the Old Testament is because every human being that walked upon the face of the earth fell into three basic categories. One, clean and holy. Two, clean and unholy. Three, unclean. So what's the first one? Second one? Third one? Do you notice the progression? It always begins with clean. All you need to do to validate what I'm saying, go and read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You will see everything in black and white. If you read Leviticus carefully, you will find out that if a man has leprosy, eh, he's unclean. And anything he touched automatically became what? Have you noticed that disease can spread, health cannot? Have you noticed? That if somebody has COVID and they enter this place, we have to protect ourselves from the COVID. But let a healthy man enter where there are COVID patients rather than afflict them with health. They will afflict him with disease. Health is not transferable. Sickness is. Because the initiating point, initiating point for every mortal is the matter of cleanliness. And sickness is corruption. If the vessel is not clean, it cannot even begin to talk about being holy. So the one who is clean and holy is that this one is pure. This one has been sanctified. And then he's holy. He has been dedicated to God. He's not just clean. He's now dedicated to the Lord. He's no longer common. The one that can use that life is God alone. He's totally consecrated. It's a consecration matter. These are the kind of people that the bridegroom looks forward to as his bride. They are virgins. Pure. 
in their thoughts, pure in their actions, pure in their daily expressions, but at the same time, they are dedicated to God. I've been offered to a deity, and now I am his sacrifice. The life that I live is not my own. That is holiness. Notice the Bible says that when the bridegroom came, they took their lamps and went out. Do you see the word that is used? They went out to meet the bridegroom. Does it not sound like something that Paul tells us? He says, come out from amongst them and be you what? Separate. Be you holy. So these were not just women who had not slept with men. These are women who had come out. They had come out from the corruption in Babylon. They had come out from the government of darkness. They had come out from unrighteousness. They were not only clean. They were what? Holy. It's sad that even though many Christians are clean, many are still very unholy. And you see, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, every commandment that he gave to Israel revolved around a single phrase. Be ye holy, for I am holy. What was he telling them? Was God talking about cleanliness there? He said, be separate. Don't be common. Be dedicated. When people look at you, they should be able to interpret the God to whom you are dedicated. So Paul, we say that we are living epistles, red of men. When they come into your environment, they should experience the God to whom you are dedicated. This is what witches have mastered. Because the average witch, the one that serves Satan, is dedicated to Satan, consecrated fully to him. If Satan says you will not marry, they immediately uproot the desire of marriage from their heart. And they will not explain to you. They will not feel bad. In fact, you that is feeling sorry for them, they'll be feeling sorry for you. But the generation in which we live, God does not even have the authority to tell a young man you cannot marry. God. This God that if we bring Reverend T up now, and at that song he was singing in the morning, I said I must know the song before tonight. I tried, but I failed. I couldn't, I couldn't score the song. I wanted to store it in my spirit. What he says, um, Jesus is worth waiting for. Regardless of the pressure, I will not compromise. I just know the words because the words struck a chord in my heart. People can sing that song or raise their two hands. We strike the keyboard now. And you say, I surrender to you. <laughs> you say, oh God, don't do it, don't do it. You say, no, 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 I want to die. And then when he finishes in the night, God now comes and says, young lady, I came to show you your prophetic script. I came to give you skill and understanding. He says, speak, Lord. And he says, for you, you will not marry. <laughs> Reverend T, you see the way they are laughing? They <laughs> live, Hosea. Now, the same person who was singing in church and saying, I will die, Qatar was coming from the nose. That same person will now realize that even though they are clean, they are not holy. And you see, this is why a witch can buy biscuit and give to somebody and walk away. What overshadows her, overshadows the biscuit, is a spirit reality. And somebody eats that biscuit and flies in the night. But we, we have Holy Ghost. We cannot even superimpose what we have on a chair. Some of you are in, are in higher institution. You have preached gospel. Preached gospel. To that your roommate that does hook up. You've done everything in that your compound. When you lead morning devotion, fire. You are a rugged evangelist. Like that old man that says, you the key boys. Your, your evangelism is with piercing words. Men break down. 
But the minute they break down, they go, in your very before, they go back. How I wish you could just implicate them and say, come and visit me in my room. Then they sit on your bed and enter into a pool of life. The problem is that we are clean, but we are not holy. We are not yet separated unto God. We sing the song, go, and have been offered to a deity, but we don't live it in reality. Can God tell you to go and die? God. You know why Paul uses the imagery of a living sacrifice? He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies what? Bro, he's not trying, Paul is not trying to mesmerize us with words. Hmm? That scripture would have still been sweet if he said, I beseech you, brethren, to present your bodies a sacrifice. Are you with me? But he knew the people he was speaking to, he knew that if he uses the word living, they will understand the concept better. Because normally, the concept of a sacrifice is that it is already dead. Are you here? It's already dead. It doesn't even become a sacrifice if it has not died. You have to kill it and put it there. You put it on the altar. And then the fire burns it up. And then it's either a burnt offering or whatever offering to the Lord. He understood what he was saying. The thing about a living sacrifice is that it's still alive. So it will decide whether to stay on the altar or not. The thing about a living sacrifice is that it can decide to get up and walk away. So your staying on the altar will be a deliberate attempt to be separated. Try it now. Take chicken. Eh? And say you've tied the leg. Then put it on the burner. And let fire come. You will know that that wing is not for decoration. It will find a way to get away from the fire. Can you stand God's heat? Paul was saying when you decide to be a living sacrifice, when God turns on the fire, when it begins to burn your appetites, confront your pride, your lust, you will decide to stay there until you become a burnt offering. Because it's out of the ashes that beauty rises. Out of the ashes. So it says you are not going to be dead though. You will intentionally, one day, the day you become reasonable, you will walk away, you will come out from amongst them and your destination will not be the pulpit, it will be the altar. You will go and lie down there and say, Lord, light the fire. And then when God begins to turn up the heat, it will be like what happened to the Hebrew boys. It will be moving from degree to degree. You know why? Because God knows exactly what he wants out of your life. And you see, precious metals do not appear at the same level. If you are trying to bring out in distillation, for those of us that did chemistry, you know that various compounds will come out at different levels of heat. Not be so? Even though my chemistry is rusty. Eh? We come out at different levels of heat. He knows what he wants to make you. And this is why the Bible says, they that compare themselves one with another, they are not wise. They say, it's, say, it's me, God is just punishing. What he, he's doing with your brother is not at the same level of what he's doing with you. Your brother might need little heat. You, you need an inferno. Because of what he wants to do with you. And notice that the most precious of them are usually requiring greater heat to expunge. The most precious of them. So sometimes, based on your blueprint in heaven, God has looked into the books. He knows what necessitated your birth. On the basis of that, he will turn up the heat. Then you will pray prayers like, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. God doesn't lead men into temptation. So what does that prayer point mean? It means, God, no matter how bad I want something, and I'm knocking violently on the door, you already know what is on the other side. Even though I want it more than life, don't open the door. That's what it means. Don't give me what I want if what I want does not align with what is in your heart. Even when I cry for it, lead me not into temptation. 
Some of you that came for this conference, the reason God guaranteed that you came is that you escaped from the altar. You know you are a living sacrifice, so you can decide when the, the I, I don't try. Say, I can't take anymore. Not be me, key Jesus. Look at that brother. Look at that sister. You've forgotten that we are not all going in the same direction. We all came to church, but what God wants to do with our lives is different. We are not the same. We are not the same. You and your brother that grew up in the same house, you are not the same. Talk less of us that just met in church and became a family. We are not the same. So you can say to one sister, marry at 21. You can say to another sister, marry at 40. You can say to another sister, you will never marry. And what he says to one or to the other, one is not better than the other. That you married and somebody else did not marry does not mean you are better than that person. That you decided to obey God and not marry and somebody else married does not mean the person is living in immorality. Because when all of us stand before the Lord, the way God is going to measure the success of your life is whether you fulfilled heaven's agenda for your destiny. Hmm. You know me? I don't want to get to heaven. And then God begins to say things like, you tried, but if you know what I wanted to do with your life, if you see how much I wanted to burst forth from your vessel, probably you would have lived better. Even though the Bible says that in that place there will, be, there, will, there, there will not be tears, there will not be sorrow, but in that place we will not all be the same. Just like Reverend Oyix was saying last night, that you want to go to the same heaven with people who they knew that if a Bible is caught in their hand, it means instant death. So they sit down in one place and memorize books of the Bible. I was saying to you this morning, our own, we are free. You can read it in the morning, you can read it in the night. But my generation never reads it. In patch lands of Afghanistan, in patch lands of China, in North Korea, Christianity is an enemy of the state. Go and find out. I'm a missionary, so I get mission reports. Go and find out. What it means is that if you are a Christian, you are the enemy of the state. The state. They find you. Young, young. But yet, the churches are growing underground. No buildings. No large conferences. Men are meeting in secret. Loving God. Some are dying for their faith. Those ones have placed their lives on the altar. Small marriage, God said, wait! You can't wait. You think that God is punishing you. You are measuring your life by the metrics and the indices of the world. Meanwhile, when the great one comes and writes, mene, mene, teke, of offer sin, none of the indices of the world will be used for that measurement. Nobody is going to ask you how many, uh, when did you marry? At what age did you marry? Nobody is going to ask you. The question in heaven when you appear before the great king is going to be, this is what was written concerning you. How much of it did you fulfill? Men who saw their script. Men who decided to be virgins, chaste, pure, and holy. When it was time to die, he said, I fought the good fight. I have finished my course. Now, like a drink offering, I'm ready to be poured out. That's an immortal talking. How did he know he had finished? Because he saw the script, he knew when he had started. He knew exactly the demands for his life. That's why Paul did not take a wife. He said, don't I have a right to take a wife like the other apostles? His consecration demanded. That man so anointed. Do you know how many sisters would have just liked to bear his son? Name? He said, don't touch me, oh God. Just let me be your wife. But his consecration will not allow him. There are, there are people here that if God comes to tell you, don't marry, you will sneak in the night 
and look for a pastor who is willing to wed you. And in the wedding, you will still say, in the name of Jesus. It's, it's a sad thing to be in rebellion and still be claiming access. It's a sad thing. All the programs we do in church now is to satisfy the carnal cravings of a generation. I don't know whether it happens in Asaba. Anointing to travel abroad. That's the theme of a program. For eight days. Me, I used to feel sorry for people. So you mean, wait first, let's analyze it together. So you mean the one who will come and will pray, I want to travel, I want to travel. I want to travel. Take! They will come day two. For eight days. Won't the people be sick? Eight days. Anointing to... The, the people who don't know Jesus that travel, did they pray for anointing? The runs girls that we marry every week, do they run looking for the one, the prophet to prophesy to them concerning marriage? But because we are clean and not holy. So the kind of bride that the Lord is coming for is a clean and holy bride. These are who the people we call virgins. They have come out and they are moral, they are, they are secretly pure towards God and righteously strict to themselves. They are clean and holy. These are the people we call virgins. Let me show you a scripture where God was speaking to the priest about who the, the priest can marry. Have you seen that scripture? Give me Leviticus 21. G begin from verse 10. Oh, a cloud has begun to seep into this atmosphere. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Aish. Leviticus 21 and verse 10. He who is the high priest among his brethren... On whose head what? The anointing oil was poured. And who is consecrated to wear the garments shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes. So this matter here, what Jesus or what God was saying through Moses to the people is, if you have been consecrated unto me, that's what he was saying. One who has gone through the process of consecration. Go and read Leviticus 8, 9, and 10. You will see what Aaron and his sons needed to go through to be able to man the priesthood. It was an intense ceremony. There was washing. There was sanctifying. There was anointing with oil. There was dressing up. They needed to be dressed up. So he says, he who is the high priest who has been consecrated, the oil rests on his head. What I want to really speak about tonight is the oil. Just stay with me. The oil. The one on whom the oil was poured and who is consecrated to wear the garments of priesthood. He's not a usurper. He's not a pretender. This one wears that garment with honor and with pride. And on his turban it is written, his consecration. Holy unto God. Not unto the priesthood. Unto God. I have not just been made clean. My garments are not just white. There is not just oil on my head. I am dedicated to God. Dedicated to God. He says, shall not uncover his head, nor tear his clothes. Next verse. Nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother. Even his own father and his mother. Even when his father and mother dies, he's not, he's not allowed to go near the dead body. Can you imagine that kind of thing? Can God tell you that? Can God demand that of you? When Aaron's sons died, my brother, God said, shh, don't even weep. Don't cry. I can imagine. Recently, I lost one of my dear sons. Dear. I traveled to the southeast, Abia, 
from Abia, two sessions, Imo, two sessions, from Imo, two sessions, to Oko in Anambra, two sessions. And in the period, my heart, I just kept remembering. If he was around, how I loved him. I know what it means to feel the pain of losing somebody. When they called me that a, a Yahoo boy ran into, he was standing on the road by himself. We just came from a mighty meeting in Abraka. Delsu. Where God moved mightily. God convicted men mightily. It was in that meeting that God spoke to me when I was about to close that there was a president who was sleeping with a sister in his church, in his fellowship. I had not even reached, or I got home in the evening when both the sister and the president sent me private messages to say I'm the one. A sweet move of God. People were broken from chains. So I was just at home. I had not eaten. It was almost to 10. My wife was trying to package something, but I was just basking in the warmth of his presence. My wife's phone was ringing incessantly. I said, I don't have power. I put off all my phones because I've been preaching for days, if I remember. I was tired. But the calls kept coming. After 10 to 11, kept coming. Ah. So I picked it. I said, Daddy, so and so, so and so, marvelous, marvelous. Ah. Quickly washed it. Got there when I saw him. His legs from here down had been crushed by that Yahoo boy. They were battling to put his bones together. And my son was <gasps> struggling to live. Do you know that that Sunday, it was Sunday service. Eh? It was Sunday service. That evening, when I was closing the service, one of the old songs struck my heart. No glory in this world. No greatness here for me. No glory in this world. My great reward is you. I wouldn't trade you for gold. This is my Lord. My goal is to see your face. And hear you say well. He's the one that plays drums for me. Hallelujah. I go back sometimes to look at the picture. He was playing drums. Because when Marvelous plays drums, he plays drums from the realm of the Holy Ghost. If he were still alive, he would have been here with me. I travel with two of them. He would have been here. I know what it means to feel. All the while we were going around when he was with him in the hospital. He called me at 4 a.m. to say, Daddy Marvelous is gone. I thought I was a strong man. I was sitting in the airport that morning. I was traveling to Abuja for a meeting from work and tears began to fall from my eyes in the public. I know what it means to feel pain. Then God now tells you don't even weep for your child. Huh. You see, I'm saying to you tonight that God knows us. He knows this generation. He knows that we can sing songs. But when push comes to shove, we bail out. The Bible says Jesus, he did not commit himself unto them because he knew that this generation, they can't be trusted. He didn't commit himself. He said, even if your father dies, the law for you is that you must not go near a dead body. He said, he shall not defile himself for his father or his mother. Verse 12. Verse 12. Nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is where? Upon him. I am the Lord. The word that is translated Lord there is the Hebrew master owner. I am his master and I am his owner. 
So if he has become my possession, I can do with him as I will. As I was telling them in Federal Polytechnic, Oko, have you ever gone to market, bro? And you want to buy a t-shirt. And the t-shirt is 1,000. Then you open your wallet. And you have 1,000 naira. You have 500. You have 200. You have 50. You have another denomination. Maybe 5, 500, 2, 200. And make up 1,000. Then you take the 1,000. And then you want to spend it. The 1,000 say, don't use me. Use the other ones. Has it ever happened? You are master, owner. You determine where to spend your currency. But my generation wants to dictate to God how he should deploy them. Want to dictate to God how he should use them. People don't really want to be called of God. They don't want to labor. They don't want it to... If they will not be visible, they will rather not serve Jesus. God didn't call all of us to be visible. He called all of us to be functional. But some of us will be functional and be hidden. Unknown, uncelebrated, unloved till you die. He says, I am the Lord. Next verse. And he shall take a wife when? In her virginity. So if the high priest wanted to marry, he was only allowed to be bridegroom to a bride that was what? Virgin. Chaste. Pure. And remember that this high priest was only a shadow of the true high priest. I'm showing you that the bridegroom who is returning, he's returning for virgins. The law, the precedence has already been set. The high priest cannot mark, cannot wed one who is not a virgin, who is not clean and not holy. He cannot. It's a law. She must be from his tribe first. He shall take a wife in her virginity. Go to the next verse. There's somewhere I'm going. This way I'm going, 14. So look at the different kinds of women that exist. In verse 13, you first see that there are women that are virgins. Then there are widows. There are women that are divorced. And there is a woman that is called a defiled woman or a harlot. This he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of where? His own people. His wife. So these things are spiritual metaphors. A widow is one whom her bridegroom has died. Her relationship with God has died. She's spiritually dead. That relationship no longer exists. The bridegroom has departed. A divorcee, a woman who is a divorcee, is one whom her covenants that she swore to uphold, she has broken and she has decided to become separated from the bridegroom. A profane or defiled or a woman that is a harlot, is that great city that the Bible calls Babylon. One who claims to be clean. One who claims to be of the tribe of the Lord, but has entered into unholy unions with Babylon. That's the harlot. The bridegroom of whom was announced in Matthew 25 is not coming from for the widow. I would have shown you if I was teaching that. I think I have that teaching on my telegram channel. The seven postures of a Christian. The postures of a son. There are seven. And there are commensurate seven postures of counterfeit Christianity. One is a sojourner. When one is a stranger. One is a widow. A divorcee. I have that teaching. A harlot. Many claim to be naming the name of the Lord, but they are, they, are, they are prostitutes. Babylon is what consumes their energy. Babylon is where their loyalties lie. Babylon is the one to whom they have sworn allegiance. Oh, you see, the bridegroom is not coming for such a church. The high priest is only allowed to wed who? Virgins. Virgins. Those who are consecrated to the law. 
You see me, if God tells me your preaching days are over, that this is your last message, I will drop the microphone with honor and go and sit down. The only reason I'm still preaching is that he has need of me. He's the one that will determine whether he will spend the 1,000 or the 200. Now we have long lines, prayer queues. People are looking for jobs, looking for money, looking for marriage. But we don't see long queues of people who are signing up to be missionaries, to go to villages. In the days of our fathers, you will see parents crying in church. Their only son has laid down his life. And said, I'm just a virgin. I belong to someone. And where he has sent me, I'm going to waste there. But I will waste in honor. That's why they were stoning a man. Stoning him to death. Men in the earth that were around his death place were celebrating that they had conquered a man. The bridegroom stood on his seat and said, A warrior comment. The bridegroom, the son of man, could not sit down to receive Stephen. Jesus stood up to receive another man. stoning him and the people that were stoning him they were not stoning him with, 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 with style. They wanted to kill him so somebody was targeting his eyeball with a sharp stone. He said, I, I, I go stone the eye. made the eye burst. Not once did Stephen complain. He didn't complain. The tears never fell from his eyes. A man was dying and heaven opened. That's the kind of death I want to die. He said, I see one as a son of man and he stand it. <laughs> ah! Jesus doesn't stand up when everybody dies. When a virgin is coming home. He said, this one, this one. This one has already died in the earth. Has already died in the earth. This one gave me their lives long ago. I'm in charge. This one died. So what greater honor than the Son of Man will stand to receive? I assure you, bro, when we die, when we are walking through the pearly gates, when rapture has taken place, you will see some people passing and angels will salute. Say, welcome, sir. Some other people, they will say, oh, low So you too, you, you made it eventually. Now what for you? But some people will arrive and there will be a line of angels. Spirits of just men made perfect. We say, Kai. The Bible says, of them, the world was not worthy. So when they see men who are in that order, they recognize them. They say, that is how we lived and they mocked us. Thank you for living what we lived. They salute them. He said, the high priest, the bridegroom, the only, the only from which he can choose a wife is that she must first of all be of his own people and then she must be a virgin go back to Matthew 25 I lay down all of my skin Lord fill me till all that flows from me is you find me and make me to oh God. Next verse. Next verse. Now, five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. If you've read this scripture, you will find out that the virgins had the same things and only deviated on two matters. This is one of the places where they deviated. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Next verse. Those who were foolish took their lambs and took no oil with them. Do you see that? Next verse. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lambs. So, ten of them were virgins. Ten of them also took lambs. Are you with me? 
but the departure occurs when it comes to the matter of oil ten of them were virgins ten of them took lamps ten of them took oil in their lamps but only five took extra oil where now the bible is using a metaphor here hmm? have you heard that the spirit of the lord of a man is the candle of the lord have you read that before so it means therefore that when the bible speaks about the lamp he's speaking about the spirit of the man and if the spirit of the man is going to be lit if the spirit of the man is going to carry fire then the spirit of the man must have oil the oil here is the symbol of the holy spirit are you with me this is what happens to you at salvation there's a theological term that is called regeneration what is regeneration regeneration is the life of god coming into your spirit that's what's happening here and how does the life of god come into your spirit by the spirit if any man have not the spirit of god he is none of his so the way god possesses you is through his spirit so the holy ghost comes into your spirit your spirit that died in adam now comes alive in christ and then the holy spirit dwells in your spirit and then he lights a fire he lights a fire so when you come into a conference like this and the words are coming from the realm of god and you know that realm when those words hit that part of your spirit you will say like the disciples did our hearts not burn did they not burn it's because there's oil so the lamp will keep burning as long as there's oil but the bible now says that the five that were wise carried oil in their vessels the vessel there speaks about the soul of the man men of god please come please come climb climb oh face the church three of you just stand here you know god created man spirit soul and body is that true and if you've been around our circles long enough you know we have debunked that teaching that says man is a spirit man is not a spirit man is spirit soul and body that means if you remove one of these entities and it is just spirit and soul it's not man if you remove this entity and it is just soul and body it's not man if you remove this entity and it's just spirit and body it's not man for the creature to be considered man it is what spirit soul and body and jesus helped us solve the puzzle when he appeared in that room with the disciples the bible says they were afraid because they thought they had seen a spirit and jesus said touch me a spirit does not have flesh and bones so if ever you've stumbled upon anybody that has flesh and bones is not a spirit is a man but man has spirit soul and body all you need to do is study genesis chapter 2 the bible says he formed the man of the dust of the ground body and he breathed into man and man became a living soul so the breath of god entered into the body and split into two soul and spirit are you with me so the soul is the real man this is his will this is where his emotions his thoughts this is his identity that's why the bible says it is the soul that sinned that shall what what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses what so the whole war that is happening in this realm is for what souls not spirit in the garden of eden when man was created the way god created man is that man by his body was supposed to be able to do business with the visible realm so he gave him senses eyes ears everything so he can do business in the visible then he gave him soul which is man's identity then he gave him spirit spirit is by is the is the facility through which man can contain god through which man can contact god through which man can express god 
So when God comes to live in you, he lives where? In your spirit. So the spirit of God beareth witness with what? Our spirit. That we are what? Are you with me? So in the original creation, when man was created, come in front of his soul. This is how man was created. The soul under the government of the spirit. This is why the man was now able to do business with God. In fellowship and intimacy. In a sweetness and in a fragrance. The body was just a shell to carry the anointed one around. Are you here? The body was just to contain the anointing. So when the Bible says man died in the garden of Eden, what happened was this facility that was alive unto God, sensitive to God, when God came, they could discern him. When God wanted something, you know, most times, I think about the relationship between Adam and Eve and God in the garden. You may think now that Adam and Eve probably never had sex in the garden. Because the Bible does not tell us. But if they were going to ever have sex in the garden, they would have done it under the visible eye of God. Hmm. Ah, yeah. No time. I would have taught you that sex is worship. I would have shown you that the act of sexual intercourse is worship. If you do it within the confines of marriage, God is God. If you do it outside marriage, you come under Satan's jurisdiction. That is why 70-80% of the diseases in the world are sexually transmitted. When you come out of the system God has designed and break God's law, something will flow. Remember, disease contaminates. So when man sinned, and the Bible says he died, what happened was that spirit broke synchrony with God. And the spirit died. And flesh became governor. What happened was that the spiritual fatherhood of man changed. Satan became the spiritual father of man. So what happens to a virgin? When you become clean, the Holy Spirit is shot into your spirit. Switch now. And then the spirit comes back as governor. This is salvation. But what happens now is the spirit comes alive so there is oil in the lamp. But the spirit also come, come and put, put come in front. Put your hand on his shoulders. The spirit now takes total control. So there's also oil in the vessel. Are you with me? So this is the lamp. This is the vessel. Carrying oil in the vessel means bringing your soul out of the government of the flesh and under the government of who? The spirit. So the spirit begins to control your appetites, control your thoughts, control your desires. Paul said, I find a war within me. The things I don't want to do, I find that they come to me naturally. But the things I want to do is a struggle. He says, I know in my flesh there is no good thing. The house for sin is the flesh. As long as the vessel is empty of oil, the soul will be under the government of the flesh. Are you with me? So it is possible. Go back. Go back to your original positions. It's possible that someone is born again. The government of flesh has been broken because you have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But meanwhile, put your hand on his shoulder. Flesh still has a hold. This kind of vessel is empty of oil. It's the flesh that dictates how to live, who to marry, where to walk, how to respond to God. It's the flesh that is in charge. The flesh is in control. So the person is born again. These are the kind of people Paul calls carnal. They are saved, but they are carnal. They are not spirit-led. They are not spirit-driven. They took oil in their lamps, but there was no oil in their vessels. There's a war that happens in your body consistently. Flesh and spirit are fighting for control of the soul. Whoever wins will determine the outlook of your life. If there's enough oil in your vessel, 
then you become an excuse for God to happen. Anywhere you enter, you are a potter for the expression of God. Anything you touch, God touches it. Anything you speak, God speaks through it. Because there's oil in the vessel. You see, I need to speak to somebody. Sit down, men of God. That you are born again is not the end of God's agenda. God does not have an escapist theory that gets her saved and brings her to heaven. That's not the idea. He saved you and kept you here so you can fight on his side. You are a warrior. And the only way you will be able to fight accurately is that there will be oil in the vessel. I've been asking God since. And as I'm here now, I've been praying for him to give me the answer to that question. Were the virgins classified as wise and foolish because they took oil? Because the wise, were the wise called wise because they took oil and the foolish called foolish because they didn't take oil? Or they are called wise and foolish because they knew whether to take oil or not. You know those two things are not the same. They are not the same. Is it that the Bible is classifying them that this one is wise because he carried oil and this one is foolish because they didn't, they didn't carry oil? Or the Bible is saying that the carrying of oil and the not carrying of oil is a product of the state they are in. The foolish ones manifested their foolishness by not carrying oil. And the wise ones somehow were able to peep into the mysteries of God and take oil. And the Lord began to remind me of a scripture. He was talking to Aaron, Moses, to tell Aaron that concerning the temple, you know in the Holy of, in the Holy, Holy of Holies, no, not the Holy of Holies, the inner court, that's the holy place. There is a lampstand. The Bible says that Moses should tell Aaron that that lampstand should consistently have oil so that the light never burns out. Have you read that scripture? So somehow, those who were wise were not wise in natural wisdom because there was oil in their vessel. They were able to peep into a blueprint that had been written years before they were born. And they understood that if the oil in the vessel runs out, then the oil in the lamp will also run out. So by that mystery, they knew that the fire needed to be kept perpetually burning. And whatever I need to do to keep it burning, I will keep it burning. Don't be angry with me. I'm not a heretic. See, how can the, the oil in the vessel now affect the oil in the spirit? Have you not read? Quench not the spirit. Have you not read it? Grieve not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not depart from a believer, but he can become silent. He can be quenched like a flame. He will be there. But he's not doing anything. He's just staying there. Because the oil in the vessel has run out. I came to ask you a simple question tonight. Do you have enough oil? Do you have enough oil? The Bible says it was at midnight that the cry came. Something struck me about this scripture. It said the bridegroom delayed in coming. Do you know that our fathers that died, some of them thought that Jesus would come before they died. So for those men, Jesus is already delayed. He delayed in coming. And then weariness hit them. Let me begin to close this now. Go to the next verse. But while the bridegroom was delayed. Give me new living translation for this verse. If you have. Where's media? Where's media located? Do we have NLT? Okay, great. Give me NLT. Hmm, this is what I want to show you. They all became what? Drowsy. And then... So their spiritual decay was progressive. It was not instant. They first became what? That's what you call spiritual weariness. I came tonight for the weary. 
And you see what the Bible is showing us there? That all ten of them became weary. It was not just the foolish. If a man like Elijah could call down fire in Mount Carmel and then a man mortal comes and says, if I do not kill you before sunrise and the man that called down fire in Mount Carmel tucked his coat under his armpit, his skirt and ran like a fugitive. And when the angel of the Lord met him, he said, Kai, I'm about to end up like my fathers. Oh God, you that came from a mysterious place, you had no beginning. We don't know your father's name, your mother's name. You just appeared from the cave. A man forged in the crucibles of the dealings of God. Prepared for such a time with the word of God in his mouth. He said, there shall not be rain these three years, not according to the word of the Lord, according to my word. A man that was talking amongst men like an immortal. One thread from a, from a mortal king, queen. And he talked his skirt and ran. All of a sudden he had become weary. He said, they have killed all your prophets. And only I am left. And God said, you lie. I have 7,000 that have not yet bound. Anybody can be weary. That's why the Bible says, Woe unto him who is alone. You must have people in your circle that there's nothing hidden. What we try to do in the RCN clan, when we begin to build relationships, we try also to build accountability structures. There are people in the clan, somebody like Reverend Austin Ukore, that I can call in the night and say, Baba, are they trouble? Pray for me. Who do you have in your life like that? You are a woman's squad. Hiding all the things that are happening to you. Your oil is about to drain. Some have punctured holes in their vessels because of the lust of Babylon. So the oil has been draining. Some have attended all the meetings. When Papa comes, he anoints you. He prays for you. One week, the oil leaks again. Because Babylon has a pipe that has been connected to your soul by which it draws your virtues. But the problem is you don't have men in your life. Because when midnight comes, you can no longer be helped. <laughs> the only time help is possible is that it has not yet become midnight. When it is midnight, it's too late. We can no longer share oil. Just imagine, as the five wives we're going. Notice the lamp is visible. The vessel is not. Eh? As they were going, Lord, I said, uh -uh. why be say you people are just this confident? Tell me. They would have shared and talked. And these people would have said, we carried extra oil. I said, eh? Okay, let me go and buy. But by the time it's midnight, nobody they sell, my brother, is late. Is late. Look at what happened in Babylon in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel heard there was commotion in the palace, commotion everywhere. And Daniel heard it. And he met the eunuch, the eunuch, the eunuch's name was Ariok. And he said, Why is this matter from the king so hasty? And the Ariok said, Problem, they will. the king had a dream. And he said, You will only believe the wise men who can tell him the dream and then the interpreter. He said, if he doesn't find such a man, all the wise men will be killed. And then he said, ah, this matter don't affect me. He said, let me go to the king. So he went to the king. What a man. He said, oh king, live forever. I know that this matter is important to you, but give me time. You know where Daniel's confidence was? Daniel understood that in his company, go and read Daniel chapter 1. He was the one giving the gift of visions and dreams. But he knew that in that his company, there were strong men who knew how to unlock portals. He knew that there were men in that company that knew how to break gates. Men who knew the pathway to the heart of God. So he went to the king and posted to the king, give me time. 
Then as he was leaving the king's palace, if he were today, we would pick his GSM and say, Ananiah, Kassala, don't pause. Don your garb of a warrior and enter your cave. Ananiah said, yes, sir. He called Azaria. He said, Azaria, when you begin to worship, realities used to escape from the realm of God. Enter your cave now. Kassala, don't pause. Azaria said, yes, sir. At that time, nobody was concerned. If it's this generation, everybody wants to re receive the vision. But everybody entered into their own order. The groaners to go and groan. The worshiper to go and worship. The intercessor to go and beg God. Because in this matter, we are not all the same. Our access levels are not the same. The Bible says, while they all prayed, the dream was not given to all of them. It went to the man who had the gift. And not once did Azariah complain. Not once did Ananiah complain. Which kind of men surround your life? Who is in your company? When your oil is running out, who can you call that will stay you and say, Sister, hold on. Hold on. Go back. There is one who is the source of oil. Do you know how oil comes? The only way a vessel can be filled with oil is that the olives must be crushed. That's the only way oil comes. The olives. Because this oil is not palm oil. It's not granite oil. This is olive oil. And to get olive oil, you must crush the olives. So the more the Holy Ghost begins to crush you, begins to work on you, fresh oil will be pouring into your vessel. If I check your tank and I see a very little oil, it shows me the level of your yieldedness to the dealings of the Holy Ghost. The more you submit to the dealings, the more the oil flows. The more the oil flows. The more the oil flows. Don't leave this mountain without oil. That's what the Lord was telling me on my bed. Don't leave here without oil. The way the high priest was consecrated, he was the one that poured the anointing oil on his head. Can I remind you that we all have been designated as priests. So we all are mandated to carry the oil. What is your relationship with the Holy Ghost like? Have you allowed him crush you? Have you allowed him deal with you? When he came to deal with you, were you ready to deal with him? You see, by the time they ran to go and buy, when they came back, the door was already shut. I don't want God to shut his door against you. And you see this thing I'm teaching? I don't deceive myself. I'm not sent to everybody. Eh? The people I'm talking to since I've been teaching, your heart has been burning. You know you are not hearing the voice of a man. You are hearing the voice of God. And as I've been talking, some of you, I see some that are fighting the tears, holding back. You see, don't just cry in this meeting. Make sure you get oil. One of my sons that traveled to the UK said, Daddy, this place not die. He said, I'm struggling. He said, even to find people of like minds to pray with is hard. He said, I missed the tent. I didn't know what I was enjoying. You just come every month, we pray 10 hours. And then you are you're on fire. You come for a meeting in our clan. You must strike one hour prayer. It's, you know the church, the denominations we grew up in. Prayer was for the people who are going to minister. So they pray in the office. But all of us we pray. You will learn prayer. By hook or by crook, you will, you will sabi pray. Because a time will come when you will be standing alone. If you've not been deeply rooted and grounded, Babylon will capture your soul. <laughs> I know people who traveled abroad burning shining and they got into UK and found out that once you pay your, your utility bills light is constant gas is running you know the drag cylinder eh? to chop food is everywhere 
Then they sat down and said, what do I need to pray about? Ah! Ah! They had become so comfortable. Their fire began to die. Because all they were taught in church is that prayer is used to get something from God. They were not taught that prayer is for alignment. When you are praying, what you are trying to do is you are trying to find the heart of God. So you are navigating. Sometimes what God wants to give you is very high. So you need to stay there for six hours. Climbing. Climbing. Because the Bible says it's on the mount of the Lord it will be provided, not on the ground. So you need to know how to ascend the mount of the Lord. And we have found out that there are two basic ladders. One is worship with songs and sound. The other is the sound of prayer. Paul and Silas were in the prison. And then the Bible says they remember that there are two protocols to bring a spirit reality. You either pray or you sing. And the Bible says they prayed and they sang. It, it was a heavy dose. So what happened? An earthquake. We want to bring an earthquake here tonight. Huh. Because some of you what the Lord showed me on my bed is that your vessel is so empty. But he wants to pour, pour fresh oil. On site and online. There is another baptism tonight. And this baptism is so that virgins will arise. Those who can stand side by side with the bridegroom. Oh, la bakaviana. Oh, to the mountain of fire we've come to behold the lion and the king on the throne to the mountain of fire we've come to behold the lion and the lamb on the throne ah. to the mountain of fire we've come tonight to behold the lion and the king on the throne on the wings of the wind on the chariot of seraphims uh, we join the angels to sing on the wings of the wind uh, on the chariot of seraphims uh, we join the angels to sing uh, Oh, 